The main topic I want to bring to you tonight isn't a new one. It isn't something I've just unearthed in the Bible and nobody else has found. It's there staring at us and it's called the Great Commission. Our first reading is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 1 to 9. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail, nor be discouraged, till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor I praise to carved images. Behold, their former things have come to pass, and new things I declare, and before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Amen. Go, it says in Matthew's Gospel. Nowhere have I even seen any suggestion in a translation of, go, of God saying, um, Please go, or if, if you've got a bit of time, if you could just go. But the point is, what God has said is a command, and that there are no exceptions to it. We are to go. And we take the good news of salvation, forgiveness, reconciliation, and a new life. When was this spoken? Well, it was after the resurrection and before Jesus' ascension. But what is our message? Sadly, it has been watered down. In fact, it's been so diluted that most people don't understand what the true message is, even in the so-called churches. Because so often, the nearest you will get to it is, oh, come to our church. And by that, they don't mean the body of Christ. They mean come to the building. Everything has just been watered down until it's not recognisable. But the outworking of what Jesus said in those three verses in Matthew we see the details of what's got to be done. We see the authority. But always let us remember that it is a command, not a request. It's something that is required of each believer. It was part of God's eternal plan in bringing about his salvation his way through a particular people who were chosen by God to bring his prophetic word to fruition, the Jews. <clears throat> now I'm not today going to 
go into where it all went wrong with the Jews, but you've only got to read in the book of Ezekiel where God was having a real go. And he says this to them. All that he was doing about sorting the Jews out, it's not for your sake I'm doing it, but for the honour of my name. We don't know how many of them grasped what he was saying. But there was one thing that had certainly happened over the centuries since God's word had been given in the form of the law when the children of Israel came out of captivity in Egypt and given via Moses. It was God's commandments, God's word. But by the time that Jesus came, and scripture tells us that was in the fullness of time, it was at the right time, God's timing, that Jesus came. He didn't just happen to be born at Bethlehem. It was all prophesied, the detail. And by the time that Jesus had ascended, every single prophecy concerning his first coming had been fulfilled. If we can trust it for that, we can trust it for still what is outstanding for his second coming. And I believe we're well on the way, at, if you like, just ticking them off. The thing was that the Jews had got into this mindset, particularly amongst what I will call the hierarchy, and it was quite corrupt, was the hierarchy, not helped by being an occupied country whose ruler claimed to be a god. And anyone, as it were, coming against that was likely to be in their sights. But the Jews, in straying from what God's word said, had come to believe that Yes, they were a special people. In fact, they were so special that they really didn't want anything to do with anybody else. They were the chosen people. We we're better than them, which wasn't what God wanted. It was to be through the Jews that he was going to work out his salvation. It was going to be through the Jews and only the Jews, that the prophetic word was going to be un unveiled. But, and we saw what it said in Isaiah, and we see what it says in Matthew there, that the Gentiles were included. No Jew could say, we didn't know, it's there. They were going to be involved with the Gentiles concerning God's plan. And Jesus made it quite clear that you, the Jews, are going to take the good news of the salvation to those people outside. His salvation was to include Jew and Gentile and was to be a free gift from himself. We all are aware that we cannot save ourselves, nor for that matter anybody else. But as believers, what is our desire and our attitude towards God? If that aspect is wrong, then our attitude to his commission will be wrong. He is the eternal God, our Heavenly Father. It is always God that we should seek to honour and not be glorifying man. 
If we say that we believe God and his word, we cannot ignore what it says about the commission given to us. It wasn't just a PS that Jesus was leaving. It was a final set of orders. In Isaiah 43, verses 10 and 12, it says quite clearly, you, talking to the Jewish people, are my witnesses. You are my witnesses. Yes, it was spoken to Israel, but as people who are beneficiaries with Israel of God's salvation, freely given through Jesus Christ, we come under the same command, even by what it says in the Old Testament, because we know, and therefore we are his witnesses. We are his people. It was through the Jews that God enabled the Gentiles to receive God's word. The Jews were the guardians of God's word. Isaiah 42 verse 1 it shows how through the spiritual, uh, scriptural truth coming through the Jews that God's plan of salvation would be revealed to the Gentiles. They had a duty and they neglected it. As Jesus said, as I implied earlier, in John chapter 4 and verse 22, Jesus was at that well in Samaria. And he had a discussion with a lady. And he was showing that the whole plan of God's atonement was through the Jewish people. And he actually said, we know. And he made it quite clear who he was to that woman, the Messiah himself. We see in this plan of God's salvation and the preservation of his word, which were through the Jews, the very people who even today are hated and despised by mankind. And even today, hatred of the Jews in this country, and particularly France, is mounting. It isn't something that we can just ignore. It is happening. I have noticed, I expect you have, there are some people who, and I'm not being unkind, when you look at them, and I'm not talking about the way they dress, I'm talking about facial features, that sort of thing. There are some people you could say, I bet they're Jewish. Others, you wouldn't know. When I worked in the bank up in London, it was very strange in a way that some branches had enormous numbers of Jewish customers. And to the outsider, it might have seemed a bit odd. But in actual fact, there was a very simple explanation. And that was, if a Jew got good service from the bank, <laughs> it would tell all his friends and they would come. <laughs> and some of them, you could meet them in the street and you wouldn't know they were Jewish at all. Most of them, I must admit, were liberal Jews, but not all of them. But there were some who they looked so much the archetypal Jew that Shakespeare portrayed in Shylock. You know what I mean. But the Jews in this country, in this town, in Amersham, if they don't look Jewish and don't have a Jewish sounding name, are unlikely to make it publicly known that they are Jewish. They'll go to the synagogue, yes, but they aren't going to tell everybody that they're Jewish and have a, an Israeli flag outside. They keep it quiet. 
because it was their countrymen, their friends, their family that went through the Holocaust. They know. They know what it's like to be hated. The plan of God's salvation, a plan which was in place before mankind was ever created, we see quite clearly in Romans chapter 11 and verses 11 to 36. It reiterates this plan and continues into chapter 12 where there is the call to holy living. There is that connection between the, the two. If the person becomes part of God's kingdom, then God requires them to be holy. Now, we, we all know that we are human, we are fallible, and we get into ways which displease God. But as Barry has quite rightly said, that, you know, we haven't to have the fear that we're going to be judged for it. We should confess it. But our sin has been dealt with on the cross of Calvary. Our sin has been judged already. All sin has to be judged. And if Jesus doesn't pay that judgment, as it were, for us, then we bear it ourselves. And that is the fate of those who refuse his salvation. A holy living and a renewed mind. Sadly, the vast majority of so-called churches in this country treat both being his witnesses and holy living as optional. I don't know where everybody in the room here tonight, um, their whole background at all, it doesn't matter. But I do know that when I was in the Church of England, there was a very noticeable attitude. It was supposed to be evangelical. But it was only after I was saved I realised there was something odd about it. And that for an evangelical church it seemed strange that I'd never heard the gospel preached. So, you know, when, you, when you're just newly saved you come across all these things which you think, I'll try and get my head around this. But that was the case. There were some lovely people there, don't get me wrong. People who wouldn't dream of missing a meeting. But they weren't saved. But there was one thing, and in a, in a sense, you could see the funny side of it, but it was also sad. And that was that if you started talking to people about Christian things, it wasn't so much that they didn't want to know and put it in those terms. They weren't beyond actually saying to you with a quite stern face that um, my faith is a private matter and I keep it to myself. Well, you just wonder where they stood. I know the day that I was saved and it was... 60 years ago, last month, I didn't hear the voice of God. I wasn't expecting anything, but I realised it was just like that. The Jesus we talked about, I didn't know him. And I was a Bible class leader. But there was a key thing, and we see it reflected in what it says in Matthew 28. And that was, I didn't know who to phone up first and tell them. I told the chap who ran the Bible class, he said, 
Go and see Max. Max was the vicar. A lovely man. A real man of God. And he was asked so thrilled. There was no question about keeping it to myself. And despite what I did know about the Bible, I felt completely, you know, empty. I, I didn't know where to start. Because there were people I knew who were Christians. And I made one mistake. And that was thinking. I'll, I'll never understand the scriptures like so and so. But I shouldn't have thought like that. Because they'd been there. They'd been exactly the same. And we shouldn't look at man. We should keep our eyes on the Lord. But these things have been witnesses. Following through the Great Commission and a holy living are not optional extras. As with Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. These days, if people know which book they're in, in the church, I think they're doing quite well. If they know the chapter, even better. As to what they actually say, well, they're treated more like ten suggestions. But they're not. And they're not in random order. They are in a particular order. Because if you pull any out of order, just take it out and say, I don't like that one, all the rest just collapse. There are ten commandments, and they should be obeyed. In Matthew chapter 28, the word go, it's in the, the first word in our translation, but if you look in the Greek, it's not, it doesn't matter. But it's the first thing that's being said, go. What are we to do? Well, we've had a look and we're to go taking the good news. And it's important to understand that it's only the first step. Because it tells us quite clearly there that we're to go in the authority of Jesus. That's in verse 18. All authority is being given to him. We don't go in our own strength. It's his name we go. When Billy Graham first came to this country in the 1950s, I, d I couldn't remember the first time, um, but I went on a subsequent one. But at the end of the meeting, when they had the people going forward, apparently they referred to them as converts. And then subsequently they changed it to inquirers. You can see why. It doesn't need a, a great mind to think that out. But the point is, we are to go and make disciples. And the reason is, we cannot convert anybody. It is totally impossible. The work of conversion is the work of the Holy Spirit. We are just the workmen taking the message. That's all God's asking us to do. Nothing more than to do it faithfully. And to bring them to the point where they will openly confess that Jesus Christ has paid the price for their sin, that they have repented. And to show their commitment, they want to be baptised. Nowhere in the Bible do you find any authority for infant baptism. The reason for that coming in was because of a misunderstanding about original sin. But baptism when it says in 1 Peter, and it's an easy one to remember, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, 1 Peter 3, 2, 1. You got it? 
it says about baptism saves you. Just putting water on people does not save anybody. All it does is get them wet. A person is only baptised after they have been saved. And it is because of a complete misunderstanding of this that we find, for example, the Roman Catholic Church, as David and Angela will know, they baptise infant baptism as many people as they can. And when you look at the world total of, of um, Christians that the Roman Catholic Church have got, little Catholics, if you like, it, it includes the me and everybody else because it is one thing that the Roman Catholic Church will accept from other churches. If they baptise somebody, you're in their fold. A bit cheeky, but that's the way it goes. And the whole thing is based on a complete travesty of what Scripture means. So we've got to be very careful when we are discipling people to do something else. And that is to make sure that what we teach is what the Bible teaches, not our opinions. Our opinions may be true, they may not. But either way, they don't matter. It's what God's word says that is important. And the baptism is in the name of the whole of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the text, if you look at it, is what Jesus said. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when people talk about the Holy Spirit just being a power of, of God, it's not a person, it's rubbish, it's, it's there. But there's something else. And it says that we are to build them up in the faith, to pass on to them the truths which have been committed to us. It's no good getting people to the point of salvation, baptising them and saying, fine, you've arrived, and then moving on to the next one. We've got to build up these people. It isn't just that they're the next generation, they're more of the present generation as well. And we need to remember that this is what the church is. The church is not bricks and mortar. The church is the people, the born-again believers. And this witnessing, this going, isn't a special job for a few people. All believers are called to witness, to testify of God's saving grace and mercy. Because when we do, we're speaking for the King of Kings. It's not something reserved for the, just the few. All of us are commanded to go. We should always be reminding ourselves Day by day, we are about his business, not our own. And we go in the power of the Holy Spirit. As I have just said, we must make sure that the message we bring is the message of the Bible. We must preach and witness the whole of God's word as the Apostle Paul said. It wasn't a, a boast. He says, I have not neglected to bring to you the whole counsel of God, the whole mind of God. We can't pick and choose bits of the Bible. There's only one message, and that message truly is good news. And there's something else that we must make very clear. I've seen the stupidity of some of it in the past, 40 years ago. 
and that is trying to alter God's word. So that it aligns more with political correctness. And the first time I came across it, I couldn't believe it. It was my best friend. And he was starting talking about not our Father in heaven, but our Mother in heaven. Now, you may be wondering, where do they get this? Well, I can only think of one occasion referred to in the, in the New Testament when Jesus, in illustrating something, said in the temple, it's like a hen, which is the female, covering her chicks. And that seems to be the sole backing for using it. And yet this wretched idea was getting a real hold on many churches. It's just folly. We've got to teach and preach the whole truth of God's word, not our variation on it. Receiving and believing the good news doesn't mean being religious or living a better life. And it's essential when we go and meet people, we make sure that they understand it's not about God accepting nice people. It's sinners who repent. And it isn't a bit better life, it's a new life. And a long life ahead of us in eternity, born again of God's Holy Spirit and a new relationship with God, a new life ahead of us, a life free from the chains of sin, for we are forgiven, we are reconciled to God. That is the real good news, and that is the message we should take. There's only one gospel. Let's be ready to share it, as we have the opportunities to tell people the fundamental truth that God has a remedy for sin. That our sins can be washed away and we can know peace with God, but only by repentance and accepting the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. It is only by repentance and being born again, that we can be part of God's kingdom. And we as believers must always be ready to go and tell others of God's salvation. I will leave what I've said with three little questions for each one of us, including me, to answer. Number one is, are we available for God to work through us? Number two, have we the desire to share the word with people? Because it can be difficult. And the third one, can we share and explain the scriptures clearly? and accurately. Jesus said, go. The rest of it is up to us. Are we going to obey? Am I going to obey? It's a command, not an option. May the Lord bless his word to us. Amen.